Crossing fam, how you guys doing today? You doing good? It is so good to be hanging out with you. I do not take these moments for granted. I've missed you. I haven't had an opportunity to talk to you in a while. And I am just so thankful to be a part of this body of believers. And that includes those of you here at our 48th Street location. Let's see if I can do this. To those of you in Macomb, in Kirksville, in 929, in Pike County, in Hannibal, in Lima, in Mount Sterling, in Keokuk, in Monmouth and Jacksonville, those of you online and those of you who are part of the crossing inside, it is great to be gathered together. If you're excited to be at church, let me hear a whoop whoop. Okay, now I don't normally do this, but I'm gonna do this. If you wanna not listen to this message, uh, you can leave. But here's the promise you have to make, that you'll go and you'll sit in your car and you'll watch Jerry's sermon from last weekend because Jerry's sermon on baptism last weekend was one of the best sermons I've heard and the best sermon I've ever heard on baptism. And you will give an incredible gift to your family if you watch that sermon and do what God calls you to. In fact, there have been people all week long who've been still responding to that message. Now, before I preached on Thursday, uh, before we even had band practice, there were three people that got baptized. There's some people who are gonna be making that decision today. And I know that there are some of you who are going, I feel like last week God was talking to me, but I was like, maybe not. And you're going, I don't know. I just need you to know every single one of our campus pastors are ready right now to have that conversation with you. The water should be warm at every single one of our locations. If it's not, let me know and I will call that campus pastor and address it, okay? There is, we have towels, we have clothes. There is nothing keeping you from starting that intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ today, so don't put it off. Now, have you ever had someone come up to you and tell you that you're doing it wrong? Okay, married guys, you're like, oh yeah, I think I've heard that before. Um, here, uh, I've done a lot of things wrong in my life. Here's one. At one point in time, and I, this is, you guys are going to go, I don't know if we trust this guy anymore. Uh, I went on a, a diet, and, but the diet I chose because I thought it would make me uh, lose weight was an all bratwurst diet. <laughs> I had them all. I had the cheddar ones, the jalapeno ones, the beer ones. I ate brats for two straight weeks. That's all I had. Uh, it was, I was delicious, um, but I did not lose a pound, not one pound, as you can imagine. Or I, I learned uh, this one. Um, when you grab a banana, how many of you open it with the little stem thing on the top? That's where you do your crank. How many raise your hand? You're, yeah, idiots. Yeah, did you go to the zoo? Notice the monkeys, they turn it upside down with the stem. I didn't know this. And they peel from uh, what we perceive to be the bottom. When you do it that way, you don't smush the banana and you get banana juice all over your hands. You're welcome. Okay, here's another one that I didn't know I was doing wrong, uh, folding towels. Now guys, uh, you didn't know you weren't folding towels right until you got, um, what's the word? Married. You, it was fine for a really long time. In fact, in the Bible, uh, Adam, uh, God made Adam, Adam was doing pretty good uh, by himself. And then God was so frustrated at how Adam was making towels that he gave him a wife because for 26 years, I had folded towels just fine. And then I got married and I had a problem on my hands. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys pay attention to like when they're selling you stuff online, how all the stuff they s sell you is like designed to be like in your living room as a showpiece. And that's not where we keep our towels. Like our towels aren't for people to see when they walk into our living room and go, oh my, who folded those? Like that's not, that's not how we impress people, okay, with our towel collection. And I would take uh, towels and I would fold them up and I can do this to this day. I can do something sweet for my wife. I can fold all the towels in our whole house. And all of our towels um, are only seen by naked people, okay? And they're behind a closed door. So you're in a bathroom, you're naked, you have to open a door and then there's the towels and I can fold all the towels and put them all away and I can shut the door. God is my witness. My wife will open one of those doors and she will see that the towels are not folded correctly and will refold all of the towels. She's impossible to live with, okay? 
because I didn't know this, and ladies, you can back me up on this. Towels are meant to be folded in, uh, folded in thirds. Am I saying that correctly? Yeah, some of the ladies just got saved. God bless you. Glad you're here. Yeah, I, uh, and I'm, I just, guys, I'll throw you a pro tip. This is how I fold a towel. Fold it in half, and then I roll it up, and I stick it in there like, a, like corn on the cob, which is, like, I, if I was going to eat this, I would just pull it out like that. That's how I fold. I'm an idiot, and I'm sorry. And so my wife says, you're doing it wrong. And there's consequences when you do things wrong. And I think for some of us, when it comes to communion, we might be doing it wrong. Think about this. If this was your first time at church, and some of you, this is your first time at church, or maybe it's your second time, but do you remember your very first time? You're going through a service, the guy speaks, everybody sings for a little bit, and then you have this part where they bring out Snacks? Is this halftime? What is, I'm still full, I mean, I'm still hungry. Like I didn't get enough. Like how many, how many am I allowed? How do you, and we just do this as if this is totally normal. And then sometimes we do it and we don't really have a good understanding of what it is that we're actually uh, doing. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna kind of walk you through communion. Now some of you might be going, what do you mean by communion? Well, um, in my church, uh, there was a, uh, a pulpit, and then right in front of it, there was a table, and then burned into the front of the table. Do this in remembrance of, those of you who grew up in church? Me, me yeah. Uh, maybe at where you grew up, it was called uh, the sacrament, or the holy sacrament, or maybe it was called the Lord's table, or the Lord's supper. Some of you, you grew up in an environment where it was called the Eucharist. Here at the crossing, we, we call the time in the service where we take the bread and the juice, we call that communion. Now, uh, we're act I'm actually gonna walk us through some communion today. We got some bread and we've got some juice. This is grape juice, this is not wine because can you imagine me finishing this sermon after four glasses of wine? God bless me, okay? And some of you are going, you know what? I think we're coming back for second service because he'll be eight glasses deep, right? We gotta, <laughs> what happened to Clayton? And a guy like me, that, no, no go. So I'm gonna walk you through this. Um, so, but before I take you through communion, I need to take you through what happened way before communion became communion. You see, communion got its roots in the Passover meal. The Passover meal is a celebration. It would be like if you were to combine the, uh, the national pride of the 4th of July. So if you're the kind of person who likes fireworks and camo crocs and once a year you like to send those tea drinkers a message that this is the land of the free and the home of the brave. If you're that kind of person, you're loving, you're gonna love the Passover. And it has the, um, the family focus of Thanksgiving. So if you're the kind of person that likes to get together once a year with all the people you don't like and eat a meal, you will love the Passover. And it has the spiritual expectation of Christmas. The moment where you receive a good gift. So the Passover meal for a good Israelite or a good Jewish person is as patriotic as the 4th of July, as family-focused as Thanksgiving, and as spiritual as Christmas. This is how it got its start. The Israelites had been in slavery in Egypt for over 400 years. They had cried out to God for him to deliver them from the, oppress of the oppression of the Egyptians, and God sends Moses to lead them out of slavery. And God uses 10 plagues to change the hearts and minds of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. So plagues one through nine come and go, and the Israelite people are still enslaved. And so God says, I'm gonna send one final plague, one final judgment on the people of Egypt. Before I do this, he goes to the Israelites and he tells them, you need to go and you need to slaughter a lamb and you need to take its blood and you need to put it over the door frame of your house. And when I see the blood, I will pass over your home and I will not judge it. But any house that is not covered in the blood will be judged. 
Can you imagine you, after service, going home to your house, and this is like your first, okay, here we go. Fortunately, you have, you know, you have your, as most of you do, especially those of you joining us in Missouri, you have your, you know, your lamb in the front yard, and you take it inside, and you, then you, you slit its throat, and then you cover your house in the blood. Well, that night, the Israelites, they put together the first Passover meal, and they celebrated it and they put the blood over the door frames of their house. And God sent out an angel to judge the land. And that night, no Egyptian home or field was spared. In fact, the only homes in which there was not profound grief and sorrow were those that were covered by the blood. Because when God saw the blood, he passed over. That very night. Pharaoh called in Moses and he released the people from 430 years of slavery. The Israelites left in such a hurry that they grabbed the bread before the yeast had been added, which is how you have unleavened bread without yeast, and they took off to leave their oppressors. And the meal The Passover meal was an annual celebration of God's deliverance of the people from the oppression and the slavery of the Egyptians. And there was bread and there was wine. And so Jesus, at the Last Supper, gets together because it's the time of the year, just like it would be July 4th and you celebrate the 4th of July. He gathers with his disciples on Thursday in an upper room and he participates in a Passover meal with his closest friends. Now, on the table would have been unleavened bread, there would have been some other objects, and then there would have been some wine. Now, over the course of the meal, they would drink four specific glasses of wine. Now, they wouldn't use four different cups like I'm using here, but I think it's helpful for you to understand the timeline of what actually happened over the course of the meal. And they would drink these four different cups and they would do so reciting the words from Exodus chapter six, verse six through seven. Think of them as a somber toast. This is what it says in Exodus chapter six. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. So they would take the four cups and they would recite different phrases from that chunk of scripture that I just walked you through. So they would take cup number one. And they'd go, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. This would have been served in the courtyard of the house where the hors d'oeuvres were served. This is before you sit down for the official meal. They would take the first cup. And then before the actual meal would start, uh, the head of the, the table, the one who was hosting the Passover meal, he would take the second cup and he would say, I will free you from being slaves to them. Still reading out of Exodus. You can't help but see what's happening here, especially those of you who've maybe spent some time in church. Here is Jesus sitting with his disciples, saying, I will free you from being slaves to them. While they are celebrating God delivering the Israelites from slavery, in just a few hours, God is gonna deliver all of mankind from the slavery of sin and the penalty of death. The actual Passover meal where they would eat took place between cup two and cup three. It would be here that they would eat the bread. This is where Jesus says in Luke chapter 22, and he took bread and he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. To those, the word right there where you see gave thanks, in the Greek, that word is called Eucharist. 
It's where you give thanks. When you take communion, you Eucharist, you are giving thanks to God for what he has done on your behalf. And here's Jesus saying, this is my body. This is the first sign that something's different. Something's about to change. I'm gonna get back to this in a second, but it appears as if Jesus is taking over the Passover meal. Then they would take the third cup. And they would say, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. If you're a visual person, as you read those words, you can't help, like me, but seeing Jesus redeeming us with outstretched arms, hung between heaven and earth, experiencing the mighty act of God's judgment that was supposed to be poured out on me, that was supposed to be poured out on you, but instead was poured out on him. Jesus says this in Luke chapter 22, in the same way after supper, the third cup, he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. Matthew records Jesus making it even more clear and he says that this blood of the covenant is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. If you were a good Jewish person, a good Israelite, sitting at this table, you would be going, what is happening here? New covenant, my body? We've been celebrating this meal for centuries. This meal is about God delivering us from the Egyptians. And here's Jesus on the final meal before he dies. And he is slowly but surely taking over the Passover. Then they would drink the fourth cup. And I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. And that would have concluded the Passover meal. It would have taken place over a couple of hours in the middle of all this. This is where Jesus washes the disciples' feet. But I just give you a snapshot. And Jesus is doing a lot of things here at this meal. The first thing is he makes the Passover about him. Jesus is going, when you see the bread, it's me. Think of me. When you, when you see the juice, when you see the wine, think of, think of me. This meal is about me and you and Jesus. Because this meal is a precursor to communion. In fact, as Jesus is changing this Passover meal, he is changing it into what you and I celebrate every single week. This celebration was uh, a ritual in the Jewish community. Every year, it was commanded by God for them to participate in it. And we as Christians, we celebrate it regularly every time we gather. Because in the early church, it said on the first day of the week, they would gather together and they would break bread, which is why we take it weekly. But Jesus also did another thing in the middle of this meal, is he starts talking about a new covenant. Now, this is interesting. Because if you are sitting at that table and you start to hear words like a new covenant, this would sound a little crazy to you. It would have the same effect as if somebody were to tell you, we're gonna have a new Declaration of Independence, we're gonna have a new Bill of Rights, and we're gonna have a new Constitution. Some of us would freak out. We're not ready for that kind of wholesale change. And here is Jesus looking at them and saying, there is a new covenant. But when you get into the New Testament, especially once you get out of the Gospels, most of the entire New Testament is written about life in the new Covenant, for those of you who are new to following Jesus or new to your Bible, when you open your Bible at the very beginning of your Bible, it says the Old Testament. That is a fancy way of saying the Old Covenant. It is about God's dealing with the people of Israel. Then you go to the New Testament or the New Covenant about 
five-eighths to three-fourths of the way through your Bible. That is the new covenant, but it is about God's dealing with all people. And the reason why you have an Old Testament and a New Testament is because of this meal, where Jesus says, I give you a new covenant. And if you were sitting at the table, around that table with Jesus, and you heard the word new covenant, you would have been perplexed. But it doesn't take long before these band of followers become zealots for the cause of Christ and the new covenant. And I'll tell you why, is because the new covenant is so much better than the old covenant. The old covenant is the blood of animals. It means that every time you sin, you would have to kill something to pay for your sins. It'd be easy to spot the biggest sinners because their hands would always be red. We would all look like butchers. The new one is the blood of Jesus, who the Bible calls the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins. Uh, the old covenant was written on stone. You remember. But the new covenant, it's written here in your heart and in my heart. The old covenant had an end and the new covenant has no end. The old covenant was the law of Moses and the new covenant is the law of Jesus and the old covenant is the law of sin and death and the new covenant is the law of the spirit of life. The old covenant was many sacrifices. The new covenant is one sacrifice for all time, for all people. The old covenant had many high priests. The new covenant has one high priest who is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you right now, even as I speak. The old covenant was powerless to save, and the new covenant has the power to save. The old covenant had an earthly temple, and the new covenant has a heavenly temple and a temple inside of you. We are temples of the Most High God. God makes his dwelling in us in the new covenant. The old covenant brought about the law. The new covenant brought about a word called grace. The old covenant condemns and the new covenant makes righteous and the old covenant exposes sin and the new covenant covers sin. The old covenant brings a curse and the new covenant redeems the curse. That's why when you read the New Testament, they are so excited to tell you about what Jesus did for you is because they're talking about the new covenant. So when we take communion at all of our different locations, what we are in effect doing is taking a miniature Passover meal where we celebrate that Jesus delivered us, saved us, redeemed us, pulled us into a right relationship with Jesus. That's why each week when we gather, it is a focal point of our service for us to take the Lord's Supper. And that's why it's important that we don't do it wrong. So if you're the kind of person who's going, okay, well, how do I do it right? I'm gonna give you four little tips and then I'm gonna tell you how I do it. The first thing when you're getting ready to take communion is what you need to do is you need to look back. You need to look back at what Jesus did for you. Communion is primarily focused on the death of Jesus on the cross. Communion is supposed to be a blood-soaked moment for us. That we look back and we remember what he did in my place and what he did in your place. Then we look forward. We look forward to when we will be reunited or we will be united with Jesus. In Revelation, for those of you who you know get bored and read there, if you go to chapter 19, verse 9, it says, Bless or then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. In heaven, which I'm talking about actually next week, there is a meal that takes place. It's a very special meal. It's a meal where you get to sit at the table with Jesus. Like he has a dinner appointment with you. Luke chapter 22, you guys have probably heard this. 
For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Jesus is the one who said that. Jesus is holding off from drinking this until he can drink it with you. It would be like me saying, I'm not gonna eat ice cream again until I get to eat ice cream with you. Just so you know, I would have you over and I would shovel ice cream into your face immediately because I wouldn't <laughs> wait. Jesus takes them through the Passover meal and then says, and I will not eat this meal again until I get to eat it with you in heaven. There is a seat in heaven with your name on it waiting for you to show up for you to have a meal with Jesus. We look forward to when we get to finally be with him. Then we look internally. So we look, we look backwards, we look forwards, and then we look, we look in, we examine ourselves. At all of our locations, there's a slide during this part of our service, and you see it there. First Corinthians chapter 11, and verse 28 is usually the part that we put up, but I'm gonna read you the whole thing. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. God is telling you that this moment right here is sacred that to come to this table or to come to this point in the service and not focus on what Jesus did, to not focus on his body and his blood is a party foul. Oh, we get this. Uh, you guys have probably watched clips or heard stories or maybe some of you have even visited Washington DC at the tomb of the unknown soldier where they do the changing of the guard. There's a great deal of reverence and respect and given there, and rightly so, for those who have given their lives for our freedom. And even the noisiest of kids and the most immature among us have the ability to recognize the somber ambiance surrounding the tomb of the unknown soldier. And likewise, when we come to communion, we do so in an unworthy manner. When our thoughts and our attitudes do not settle on the undeserving love of God. When they don't settle on the fact that he went through hell for us. That painful sacrifice that Jesus offered, he offered it in my place. And we're to evaluate our behavior at the point of communion and focus on the cross. This is not a time for you to examine how bad you've been last week. I'm gonna give you a newsflash. You've been bad. You don't, you don't go to communion and go, I think I was a lot better this week than I was last week. I mean, I'm, I'm really dialing it in. You're doing communion wrong. Communion isn't a time for you to think about you. Communion is a time for you to think about Jesus. If you go to the tomb of the unknown, unknown soldier and you walk away from there going, I'm pretty awesome. You're an idiot, <laughs> right? Like someone should, you know, I shouldn't say the next part. You, you just, you're dumb, right? When you come to communion, it is not a time for you to go, man, I'm killing it. Or man, I stink. We know you stink, I stink. Why do we stink? Because we're sinners. Why are we at communion? Ah, because Jesus came for sinners. We focus on him, on the work of Jesus on the cross. And then we look out. Who all did Jesus die for? Jesus died for all people. That means he died for the people you love and the people you hate. He died for people who know better and he died for people who should know better. He died for all people. And there's something special that should happen, especially in the church, when we take communion. And we take communion 
with people we don't see eye to eye on. And they are sharing in the same cup that we drink. There's some of us, we're taking communion and there's people here or different locations that we don't agree with, that we don't like. And it's good for us to realize that they're taking communion too. That means if you're a Republican and you see a Democrat taking communion, it's good for you to know, oh my goodness, uh, Jesus loves them too, and vice versa. If you're a pro-union or an anti-union person, it's good for you to see the other person from you getting ready to take communion and realizing that Jesus died for, for them too. Wherever you stand with Black Lives Matter or uh, the Blue Line, it's important for you to realize that there's people who don't necessarily see eye to eye with you on things on this earth, but have been bought and redeemed and are loved, and God was willing to send his son for them too. It does something to you when you realize that Jesus didn't die for just you. I get frustrated at this. Because there's people I don't like. But I need you to hear me say this. I don't care who you are and I don't care how bad your story is. Nobody on earth has ever been as bad to you as you have been to God. And his response was to send his one and only son to redeem you, to change it, to fix it. So how do I take communion? I mean, I'm here three services a weekend, 52 weeks a year. I got 156 communions to navigate. How do I take communion? One, I don't take communion every service. Some of our campus pastors, they might not either. So if you're taking communion and you see somebody not taking it, don't be judgy. Take your communion. Don't worry about us, okay? You're doing it wrong, okay? Second thing is, is I wanted to have these prayers that would focus me in on the Lord. So I pray four prayers, and I actually, most of the time, I'll get two little chunks of communion. I'll have two little pieces of bread and two little pieces of juice. And I pray four prayers, and I wanna give you these four prayers that maybe you can put in your back pocket, and they can be helpful for you. The first prayer I pray is thank you for paying a price I could not pay. It is important for me to realize that in the grand scheme of things, I did not stand a chance to write my life. It doesn't matter how pretty you are. Pretty is not what gets you into heaven. It doesn't matter how much money you make. There's not enough money to get yourself into heaven. It doesn't matter how many people you help. You can't help enough people to get into heaven. It doesn't matter how many people you're nice to. Nice doesn't get you into heaven. There is no way, 0% chance, that you and I get to heaven on our own. There's only one way, and that is people who've been covered by the blood, that have taken on the blood of the new covenant that was poured out for them, and the judgment of God passes over them and lands on Jesus. That's how I get into heaven. That's how you get into heaven. We get into heaven the exact same way, through an, on a narrow road, through a narrow gate, named Jesus Christ. Thank you for paying a price I could not pay. My second prayer, thank you for not giving up on me even though I deserve it. It is important for me to remember that I do not do not deserve the love of God. I hear people say, you know, God is a God of second chances. Yeah, right. I was through my second chance by the time I dried off from getting baptized. That's me. I don't, I don't know what chance I'm on, but I haven't deserved any of them. Not a one. I can't get over the fact that he still chases me down, that his goodness and his mercies are still available to me. And the moment we start thinking we deserve the love of God, 
We are not in a right relationship with God. My first two prayers are Eucharist prayers. I give thanks. Then prayer number three, help me to live a life in response to your love. I want the love of God to change me. I want it to affect me, motivate me, turn things around in me. I don't wanna be one of those people that comes to the table, remembers what Jesus did for me, becomes aware of how good God is, and then walk away as if nothing has to change. But be real with me. How can you, we, we look at what Jesus did on our behalf and stay the same? And then the fourth prayer. Help me to remember you didn't die for just me, but for the sins of the whole world. A communion that doesn't make its way into your classroom, a communion that doesn't make its way into your workplace, a communion that doesn't make its way into your home isn't done right. Because when we come to face with the love of God, we have to recognize God doesn't love just me. He loves all the people around me. And it makes me wonder, what would this church like and what would this world look like if we started taking communion right? I want you to think about that as we move to a time of decision.